We're going to <clears throat> do a responsive reading, and the words uh, will be up on the screen. We light a candle of love and imagine. We light the candle and pray for God's face to shine on us, to save us, restore us. We notice, O oh God, that when you feed people, everyone has enough. Some have more than enough, and many are still hungry. Te and the people said, We notice. We notice that in our world, there are many ladders, and many are climbing. God of mercy, lower us, raise us, empty us, and fill us. Like an empty manger, we want to be ready to receive Emmanuel. Our souls magnify the Lord. Our spirits rejoice in God, our Savior. God has looked with favor on our loneliness. The Mighty One has done great things for us, and holy is God's name. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 14, and I'll be reading from the NIV version. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. God, we come this morning anticipating a word from you. We thank you for your servant, Phil, who has put in the time, the preparation, to listen, to be a vessel to bring your word to us at this moment today. May our hearts and minds learn and be open for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's Christmas week. Can you believe that? We're already at Christmas. We've been anticipating it for four weeks now, and it is coming. 
the advent. Thank you, Gerald, for that explanation of advent. It was new for me and helpful. Um, just a reminder, again, it, we're going to be having communion at the end of the message, so uh, hopefully you picked up your cup in the back as you came in. Those at home have um, prepared your elements for communion and um, you're ready so that when we get there we can jump right into it. How do you describe God? If someone asked you to describe God, what would you say? What are, what are the images that you would present? What are the, the ways that you would describe God? And I, um, in this sermon, I'm going to suggest that the images that we keep in our mind of God are also going to be the images that we reflect to others, whether we want to or not. So if we have a very loving and kind image of God, we're going to tend to reflect and work towards reflecting that kind of image. But if we have images of a God who's angry, who is hurtful, punishes, punishes sin, we're often going to reflect also that image of God. And so uh, as we go into what we're talking about today, I invite you to think about that. The God you imagine will be the God you reflect. It greatly influences our ability to say, is God, can I trust you? God, can I love you? Can I believe in you? And the image that we have of God greatly affects our life. And I even know people who say they can't believe in a God, but if you ask them how to describe that God they say they don't believe in, they often will describe a violent God or an ev almost an evil God. And I think most of us here can say, yeah, I don't believe in that kind of God either. The image of God is important in our life, and so our title this morning is Imagine God's Face. An illustration. Most of us have one of these in our pocket. Mine's older than some of yours, and um, in fact, old enough that about a year ago, I started to get texts and emails saying, hey, it, come January of 2022, your phone is not going to be usable anymore because technology has changed. And so they're telling me I need to get a new phone. And as I researched and said, okay, well, what kind of phone should I get? I began to realize that there's new technology on the phones that this one doesn't have. And so I'm going to try and explain one of those technologies, but to be honest, I've never used it in my life, so I don't know for sure that I got it quite right. But one of the new technologies, uh, well, security for one has greatly changed throughout the six, seven years that this phone has existed. Um, I have basically two options on this phone. I can either choose not to secure it, or I can put a security pin code on it that I have to type in the number. But if you buy a new phone today, you have two other security options, and one of those is fingerprint. Some of them you can put your finger on it, and it'll read your fingerprint. And if it's, you had already scanned it in, if it recognizes your fingerprint, then you can use the phone. If someone picks it up and tries to access it, they can't do it. But the most recent is facial recognition. That means that when you set up your security, you take a picture of your face, and the phone scans it. And so all you need to do is pick it up and look in the phone and it turns on for you. But if somebody else picks up the phone who, and it doesn't recognize the face, it remains blocked. The way it does it is different than how people work. When you scan your face, the computer measures 
the distance between your eyes, the inside of your eyes, the distance between the outside, the distance from here to here, the, dis the width of your nose, the width of your mouth, and it creates this code that is based on your face. And so it all of a sudden knows who you are because it scans all the other codes, and if yours is the right one, it lets you in. If it's not, then it doesn't let you in. It's also a technology that police are using quite regularly now as they have pictures of someone in the act of a crime. They'll scan it into their computer and the database will just look at the millions of different codes that they have created. And if it finds the right one, it goes ding, 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 ding. We get, this is your guy. And the police think they've figured it out. Um, pretty amazing technology. Sometimes I wish it was that easy to recognize God. That I had some sort of code in me that immediately when God shows up, my brain goes, oh, it's God, hi. You know, like when you walk in this room, I recognize each of you for who you are. And I can say your name and it's, um, if I've never met somebody, I cannot recognize them because I don't have the database of codes in me. We as humans need to have relationship with each other to be able to say, oh, okay, that's who that person is. And that's how our relationship with God works. We recognize God not through some simplified code that we have established our human nature would like it to be that simple but it's not we recognize God through the images and our experience with God throughout the year and through well throughout our lives not just a year but throughout our lives and one of the keys is this book this book presents to us if you think about it I would be like to know how many different images of God are in this book. And sometimes one works to apply to our situation or our circumstances, and another one doesn't. But as we try and recognize God's face and we think about who God is, to a certain degree, we need to take the sum of all the images we have in here and understand who God is and you know that that's probably very difficult to do because of all the images in here it's very complicated to say okay this is God because as soon as I do that I often realize wait a minute this is God too and they seem to conflict with each other who is God how do we recognize God's face. And the face we recognize, how do we feel about that? Let me talk one more thing about face. We're not talking about blue eyes, brown eyes. We're not talking about red hair, brown hair, black hair. We don't recognize God by those physical attributes. It's, again, one of the complications as we think about God's face, as we work to imagine God's face. We recognize each other by a lot of those attributes. But God cannot be recognized in, the way, in that way. Let's look at some of the images that we see in here and recognize that as we try and determine the full sum of all these images, it, there's a lot of mystery in there. And part of that is because that's just how big God is. In fact, when you read this, how many times, how many hundreds of times have you read a verse and you go back and you read it again and all of a sudden, you're reading it the hundredth and one time and all of a sudden God shows you something new in those couple verses 
about who he is and his image. And we go, wow, why have I never understood that before? Or why have I never seen that before? All through the Bible, God reveals himself. Old Testament, New Testament, God is there. And last week, Pastor Claire talked about Adam and Eve walking in the garden with God. How did they know they were, how did they know it was God? The Bible doesn't really describe that for us. They don't really give an image that they, it was just a presence that walked in the garden with them. And it's left to our imagination a bit to figure out what that means. But yet, we learn things about God and his character as we recognize that he loved Adam and Eve. He had created Adam and Eve. He had created creation, the whole, the whole earth, the garden. It was his design for the world, for the earth, and he said, it is good. He liked what he had created. He loved what he had created. And he enjoyed spending time with them. That is until Adam and Eve disobeyed. What changed in the relationship when, they cha when Adam and Eve sinned? It didn't change God's love for them. God continued to come back and say, Adam and Eve, where are you? But Adam and Eve's view of God changed. They were now ashamed. And they hid. So God came to find them. He lovingly searched them out. And their nakedness he covered. The consequences of their sin was that they could no longer live in the garden. It wasn't punishment. It was the reality that their sin had created this barrier of separation between them and God. Their behavior had a negative impact on their relationship with God. It changed the way Adam and Eve viewed God. It didn't change how God viewed Adam and Eve. He still loved them, still cared for them. Throughout the Old Testament, God appeared to many people, and we don't have time to look at all the stories, and most of you know a lot of them. In fact, you probably are already thinking of one or two. But some of these images seem to, are hard and difficult to understand, especially in the Old Testament, right? Some of them seem to describe a God who is, is at times angry. A God who, who punishes sometimes very harshly. A God who seems to be demanding and requiring us to act and behave a certain way based on the law. A God who, yeah, at times gets angry. And we see some of that in the, in the ways we view the story of the flood. The God who appears in thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai when the people are wanting to see God and understand God at the time that Moses was receiving the pillars. How about a God that destroys an evil city of Sodom and Gomorrah and then the, the only um, faithful persons in there are leaving and turn around and look back and all of a sudden they're a pillar of salt. These are images that are disturbing. They're hard to understand and they just, for a lot of us, it's hard to make sense of it. And we left with a lot of questions and mystery about who God is. And I wish... I could give you an easy answer and fully explain it this morning. But I can't, to be honest. I don't know if anybody can. We, we, 
we can't. But as I've walked with God, as I've experienced God, I would say that this is not the God that I know. And hopefully, as we proceed further in this message, you'll understand a little more what I mean by that. The God I know doesn't expect us to live in fear of him, of punishment for our sins, but wants instead for us to live in the freedom of salvation, forgiveness, grace, and mercy. And it's for that reason that God came and endured the cross. There are, however, many other images in the Old Testament that I would use, that I would use to describe God. We already talked about how lovingly he walked with Adam and Eve. How about the fact that in the flood story, he chose to save Noah and his family? How about Moses and the Israelites who were slaves in Egypt and God chose to save them from their slavery? And then went, led them a pillar of fire at night, a cloud by day, that would go ahead of them. When it moved, the people followed. When it stopped, the people set up camp. And God cared and showed them the way. This is where you are to go. How about the image of a God who continues to love his adulterous wife that we find in Hosea, the book of Hosea? Or a God who shows mercy to Jonah. Jonah who was given a job to do and he said, no way God, too big for me, too scary for me. Those evil people, I'm not going to go to them. And so he runs and God graciously invites him, Jonah, you can do this. I want you to do this. And the people of Nineveh, when they hear the message from Jonah, repent. And God gives them grace and mercy. Of course, Jonah's angry about it. He said, God, that's why I didn't want to come in the beginning. I knew. He didn't want the people of Nineveh to be saved. They were too evil in his mind. I guess, if I'm honest, I'm like that many times. These are the stories we, in these stories we learn that God is a God who cares, a God who is compassionate, gracious, a God that clothed them, the children of Israel, or Adam and Eve, when they were naked. A God who fed them manna when they were hungry. A God who gave them a drink out of a rock in the midst, in the desert. A God who spent time with his people. His presence were with, was with the people no matter the circumstances they were in. He loved them. He cared for them. His face shone on them. Yet because of their sin, the people felt this barrier, this relationship struggle. It wasn't God's fault. It was their fault because they chose to misbehave, to sin. It was their nature. And they went through moments and seasons in the wilderness. They went through moments of loneliness, of suffering and difficulty. And they would cry out, God, where are you? How long? David writes in Psalm 6, my soul is in deep anguish. How long, O oh Lord? How long? And God gave the people psalms. Psalms was their worship book. It was the, the songs they would sing, the prayers they would pray as they met in 
to worship as we are doing this morning. Psalms 80. It was referred to in our candle lighting. The people would use it they, during difficult times. They would say this psalm, and I'm just going to share one verse of it. One verse that is repeated three times during this psalm that says, Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. There was something about the people's desire for to know God's face. God, shine your face on us. Would the Lord shine his face on them? God told them he would. In number six, God gave the priest a blessing that they were to say during worship. We sing that blessing here uh, probably more often than any other prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The people longed for this kind of peace. We're not talking just a freedom from violence. We're talking about an internal contentment, an uh, internal experience of just be still and know it's going to be okay. And the prophets, the prophets promised a Savior would come. God would shine his face on them through a Messiah. This Messiah would save the world. What an amazing story. There are times when that hits me really hard to recognize that's how much God loves you, us. The fact is God's love would not allow him to turn his face from his people. His face would shine on them again. This morning I had Gerald read John chapter 1. I call it John's Christmas story. We don't think about it being a Christmas story. But John says, Jesus existed from the beginning of time. Why? Because Jesus was the creator. Jesus was the giver of light. When God said, let there be light, Jesus was there. And Jesus was that light. And Jesus was the giver of life. When God breathed into Adam and Eve the breath of life, Jesus was there. While the Christmas story in Matthew and Mark focuses on the humanity of Jesus, describing the birth of a baby, John focuses on Jesus as God, Emmanuel, as Gerald used, God with us. God became flesh and moved into our neighborhood, as the message says. And Pastor Claire last week described it as God veiled in human flesh. We talk about Trinity. And I understand why and I believe a lot of the theology. But sometimes English or any language, words for that matter, struggle to be actually describe God. And sometimes they mislead us. So as we think about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our mind struggles. And sometimes we get really quick 
to separate them into three entities. But the core of the theology is that all three are God. Jesus is God come to earth. And that's, John wants to focus on that. We tend to want to say God sent, God the Father sent his son to die. But in saying that, we risk turning God into a horrible father. And there are people to accept that about God. I've heard many say that. John's version of the Christmas story emphasizes Jesus who is God himself, come to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. God who chose himself to take on flesh. God who veiled himself in a human body. God who chose to die for you and me. God who endured the cross because of his great love for you. Our language uses Jesus as his human name. To describe him, we use son. But it was God, a loving God who came, endured the cross, because he desired so much to be with us. He desired to restore right relationship that he could walk with us again in the garden. When we imagine the face of Jesus, of, of God, I'm sorry, when we imagine the face of God, the clearest image that we have is Jesus. And because of that, we center everything else we believe, even the way we read the Old Testament through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures in John 5, 39. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. The Pharisees didn't have the advantage we have. We're reading the Bible from a post-Jesus. They were reading it from only the Old Testament. And I can understand how we could get uh, difficult images of who God is from Old Testament. But because Jesus is the clearest and best image of God, we reflect on the full Bible and every image we find in here through the eyes of Jesus. John 14, 7, if you really knew me, Jesus talking, you will know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. John uses Images of Jesus as the way, the truth, the bread, the light, the life. But if what Jesus says is true, could we say, God is the way, God is the truth, God is the light, God is the life. The Pharisees knew Jesus in this statement was claiming to be God. And it is this claim that caused humans to nail Jesus to the cross. Jesus could have resisted. He had the power to do it. Yet Philippians 2, 6-8 says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider Equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Paul, too, was convinced that Jesus was God. Colossians 1, 15 to 16, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. In conclusion, one more passage, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 to 11. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, displayed in the face of Christ. God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure of jars of clay, to show that this surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our body, our mortal body. Jesus, the physical representation of God, gives us the light of the knowledge of God's glory. And we too carry God's presence through the Holy Spirit in us. It is the Holy Spirit that allows us to then reflect God's image. There's no clearer image of God in the Bible than Jesus. And we are invited to live as Jesus lived, and in doing so, we reflect a loving God to people who long, continue to long to see God's face. The God we imagine will be the God we reflect. Only through Jesus can we learn to know God's character and the deep love God has for us. May God shine his face on you, be gracious to you, and bring you peace. Jesus took the cup. Jesus who allows us to come, invites us to come to the table. God who wants to be with us invites us Because of his love, because of his forgiveness, because of his goodness, because God revealed his true self to us through the body of Jesus, we come to the table. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray before we eat. And if you want to take your wafer or your, your bread in your hand as we pray. Lord, thank you. God, thank you for your body. 
for enduring the cross. To restore relationship with you. To bring peace. To shine your face on us. As we enter into this week where we celebrate Christmas, Lord. Help us to see you as a God who loves us, who cares for us, who longs to be with us and invites us to your table to be restored, to be saved. In your name we pray. Amen. Take and eat in remembrance of what Jesus did for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray again. Lord, thank you for the new covenant. A new covenant of love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy that allows us to walk with you each day. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that guides us and leads us as we try and navigate the difficulties and struggles of life. That leads us as we find peace and joy as we attempt to love others as you love them. And as we attempt to understand your great love for us, Lord. Thank you for the new covenant of your blood. Amen. Take and drink in remembrance of the new covenant Jesus provided for you. A covenant of forgiveness, grace, and mercy. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. When I, when I was picking out the songs for this morning, I really didn't realize how well this one fit with the sermon. But if you think of an image of, of Christmas, most of the time you think about the little baby in the manger, and that's what this song is about. The old hymn, What Child Is This? Everybody sing, please. What child? 